Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at Berkshire Community College. My name is Judith Weiner, and I've got a few short announcements for you. If you'd like to learn more about program at OLLI at BCC, you can check out our website that's going in the chat. We have a number of online and in-person um, programs coming up in the next month. Be sure to look at the OLLI at BCC calendar of events. Also going in the chat is the link for that including more free and open to the public author talks and our shared interest group open house on November 15th. Our winter semester of classes will begin on January 22nd and course information will be on our website in December. I am now going to turn things over to Oli, Man Oli member Nancy Fernandez-Mills, who will introduce tonight's speaker and who will moderate Q&A later in the program. As we go, if you have questions, please put them in the chat. Thank you very much and um, over to Nancy. Thank you, Judith. Uh, Lawrence Steinberg is one of the world's leading experts on adolescence, and he is the Distinguished University Professor and Laura Carnell Professor of Psychology and Neuroscience at Temple University. Dr. Steinberg is the author or co-author of approximately 500 articles and essays on development during the teenage years. His latest book, is you and your adult child, how to grow together in challenging times. Welcome, Dr. Steinberg. Thank you very much. Um, and thanks everybody for being here um, with us for this lecture. Um, it's often said that adolescence begins in biology and ends in culture. Puberty marks the beginning. The end is defined by a series of transitions into new social roles and the achievement of certain milestones viewed by society assign somebody's an adult. Today, becoming an adult is delayed and prolonged. Although they start the passage at about the same age as their parents did, it takes today's young people many more years to complete it. And this, it turns out, has important implications for their parents that haven't received a lot of attention. So this evening, I'd like to explore this with you. More specifically, I'm going to discuss how parents' relationships with their adult children have changed and the implications of these changes for family life, parents' mental health, and the passage of young people into and through adulthood. Now, I've devoted my career to studying and writing about teenagers and more recently young adults. I've been teaching undergraduate and graduate classes on adolescence for close to 50 years. And in addition to writing scientific papers for academic journals, I've written several books aimed at popular audiences. In these books, which are mainly for parents, I translate what science has taught us about adolescence and explain how parents can use this knowledge to build better relationships with their kids. As a developmental psychologist, I believe that it's essential that parents understand the stage of life that they and their children are in. But while there are plenty of books written for parents, in general, the number of them declines as the age of the child in question increases. Hundreds of books are published for parents of newborns. A lot of books, but certainly not in the hundreds, are written for parents of toddlers and preschoolers. Fewer books exist for parents with elementary school kids. Now, there's an increase in books written for parents of teenagers, but unlike books for parents with younger kids, those aimed at parents of teenagers are mainly about the things that drive parents crazy. If you don't believe me, go online and look at the titles of books for parents of teens. You'll see a disproportionate number with the word survive in the title. I've seen dozens of these survival guides for parents of teenagers, but I've yet to see a book that explains how to survive your baby's infancy. And let me tell you from my experience as a parent that I often wondered whether I was going to survive those first three months of our son's life when I was a sleep deprived zombie. But I never once worried about whether I was going to survive his adolescence. In my previous book, Age of Opportunity, I discussed how the delayed and prolonged transition into adulthood might be affecting the psychological development of young people. Was their development stunted by staying in school so long, by waiting so long to get married, by putting off the work of becoming an adult to later and later ages? But although I spent a lot of time thinking and writing about these issues, I didn't stop to consider whether delaying adulthood was also having an impact on the young person's parents. In retrospect, I should have given this some thought. Most parenting books are about the impact that parents have on children, not the reverse. 
But I knew from my research and my experience as a parent that the reverse is also true. We are affected by our kids' development. In fact, one of my first books for parents of teenagers is titled Crossing Paths. The title refers to the collision of adolescence and midlife. Most adults are going through midlife when their firstborn child is going through adolescence. I had intended to write a book about the ways in which parents affected their teenagers' development. The book was based on a study I did of families whose oldest child was becoming a teenager. But as I began to organize my thoughts, I realized that the more interesting study to tell is about how having a teenager affects their parents' psychological health and development. And one of the themes of this book is that adolescents may be a lot tougher on middle-aged parents than on their kids. One mother told me it was like being bitten to death by ducks. When you're a scientist who's been around for a while, I'm 71, you start to get requests to write autobiographical essays in which you're asked to reflect on your career. It's flattering, but it's kind of depressing. It reminds me of something one of my mentors said during a social gathering in his honor at Cornell, where I did my graduate work. My mentor was a very well-known and popular professor who spent almost all of his career there. Someone at the party approached him to make chit chat and asked, have you lived in Ithaca your entire life? And he answered, not yet. In an essay I recently wrote about my career, I talked about how so much of it had been shaped by unanticipated events. And I'll confess to you that I'd never expected to write a book about what it's like to parent an adult child. That all changed with a phone call that came out of the blue. My agent called one afternoon to ask if I'd be interested in writing a book for parents with adult children. He'd been contacted by the editor who had worked on Age of Opportunity. My editor had been contacted by AARP, the organization that advocates for people who are 50 and older. I suspect that some of you may be AARP members. AARP had been hearing from more and more members who were finding that parenting adult children is much harder than they had expected. They wanted help and they couldn't find any resources. So they reached out to Simon and Schuster, with whom they had partnered on several previous books. And luckily for me, when they called the publisher, the person who answered the phone was my editor, who then got in touch with me through my agent. After I agreed to take on the project, I began doing some preliminary research into the topic. I learned that there are a lot of parents with adult children in the United States, by my estimate, about 65 million. These parents are baby boomers, and a lot of their children are millennials, two of the largest generations in American history. And these are two generations that are very inclined to turn to self-help books when they feel lost. So that's the origin of You and Your Adult Child, which was published this past April. I didn't initially intend it to be focused on the way in which the protracted transition from adolescence to adulthood was affecting young people's parents. But as I wrote, it became clear that this was going to be a major part of the story I wanted to tell. And that's the story I'm going to tell you tonight. One of the hardest things about writing a book for a popular audience is coming up with a good title. We knew we needed a pithy phrase to describe children in their 20s and 30s because we wanted a title that would get the attention of parents with kids this age. After months of discussion, my editor and I settled on adult child. I didn't want to call them young adults or emerging adults because psychologists generally use these terms to refer specifically to people during the first part of their 20s, and I was envisioning a wider age range. But adult child has negative connotations. To me, it sounds like it's a reference either to Donald Trump or young Sheldon, and that's not what I wanted to convey. I'm not referring to adults who act like juveniles or children who are obnoxiously precocious. I'm simply referring to sons and daughters in their 20s and 30s. After agreeing to do the book, I tried to review the literature on parents and their adult children. I discovered that almost nothing had been written on the topic. When people in their 20s and 30s are the focus of psychological research, they tend to be looked at as students or workers or spouses or parents. We rarely stop and think of them as people who still have active relationships with their own parents. One exception 
is the surprising number of books on estrangement, many of which were written not by scientists, but by bitter or anguished parents whose kids had severed ties with them. Books like Walking on Eggshells, A Son is a Son Until He Gets a Wife, Done with the Crime, and other melodramatic titles that sound like Netflix originals. I also discovered numerous articles in the popular press referring to an epidemic of estrangement. They mentioned studies that estimated that one fourth of young adults are estranged from one or both parents. Could this possibly be true, I wondered. I have to tell you that I was skeptical. And it turns out justifiably, because if you read the original research, you find that this number is very misleading, partly because of the loose way that estrangement is defined. I think of estranged children as those who had a long-standing relationship with their parent and then cut their ties to them, stopped seeing them or communicating with them. But this isn't the picture of estrangement that emerges from the few well-done studies of it. Some of the studies of so-called estranged children are estranged from a sibling or a grandparent. And even the vast majority of young adults who say that they're estranged from a parent are estranged from a parent that they never really knew to begin with. Often, this parent is a biological father who had never been in the child's life, typically because they abandoned the family or were left by the child's mother. So the reason that the child is estranged from their father is that their mother is estranged from him too. So if you exclude people who are estranged from a biological parent who didn't raise them, or who's estranged from some other family relation, the proportion of estranged adult children is less than 10%. Now, that's not a tiny number, but I wouldn't call it an epidemic. So why were all those AARP members clamoring for a book for parents with adult children? Why are so many of them in need of help? Why now? What's different today? I think three things have changed. The transition into adulthood has changed, parents have changed, and the times have changed. Let me start by considering how becoming an adult has changed. In modern society, the transition into adulthood isn't defined by a single event or a particular milestone, like a rite of passage that you might see in a traditional non-industrialized culture. In the developed world, the transition to adulthood is incremental. Adolescents become adults gradually, one step at a time. The process has a beginning and an end. And because of that, we can measure how long it takes to get from start to finish. Now, you've no doubt seen reports in the press about how it's taking young people longer to become adults. But I wasn't sure whether this is because they're starting the transition later, finishing it later, or both. So I decided to look at census data to compare the transition of today's youth with that of their parents' generation. Suppose we say that the transition from adolescence to adulthood begins with college graduation and ends with starting a family, with other milestones like launching a career, becoming economically independent, moving into one's own place, and getting married in between. Now I know not everyone graduates from college or becomes a parent. And I'm not saying that you need to do these things to qualify as an adult. But it's a convenient way to look at how the length of the transition to adulthood has changed across generations. Because we can use the same indicators to compare different time periods. Today, it takes young people an average of about 13 years to make the journey from college graduation to parenthood. It took their parents about eight years. In other words, it takes today's adolescents 50% longer than their parents to complete the same sequence of transitions. Young adults are starting this transition at a somewhat later age because slightly more than half of today's college students take more than four years to get their degree. But events that usually follow graduation are being delayed even more, especially marriage. In 1990, the average age of first marriage was 23 for women and 25 for men. By 2020, it had risen by five years for both sexes. And this in turn has led to later ages for starting a family. One of the most striking differences between the generations is in the timing of residential independence, which as I'll explain, may have contributed to the later age of marriage. 
Today, because of the high cost of housing, the most common living arrangement among Americans in their 20s is to live with one or both of their parents. This was never the case at any point in the 20th century, even at the height of the Great Depression. In addition to forcing many young adults to move back home after college, the precarious financial situation they face has had two other important consequences. First, as many of you probably know firsthand, the proportion of young people who depend on their parents for financial support has risen dramatically. Even before the pandemic, the proportion of 25 and 26 year olds who relied on their parents for at least half of their financial support had tripled since the year 2000. And the proportion of 27 and 28 year olds who did so increased by 50%. Today, nearly one third of millennials receive financial support from their parents. Now, in addition to the shortage of affordable housing, many 20-somethings also have problems jump-starting their careers. When they start job hunting, they encounter educational requirements beyond just having a bachelor's degree, or discover that the kind of job they had their heart set on is really hard to get. As a result, they end up living with their parents longer than they or their parents had expected. The other consequence of the financial strain faced by young people is reflected in their poor mental health. You've probably read many stories in the popular press over the last year about the mental health crisis among American teenagers. Well, that crisis pales by comparison with that afflicting young adults. According to a study released last week by researchers at Harvard, more than a third of people between 18 and 25 suffer from anxiety, and nearly 30% suffer from depression. In both cases, that rate is double that for people between 14 and 17. I think all of this is affecting parents with adult children in ways that haven't been adequately discussed. You're probably familiar with the adage, you're only as happy as your least happy child. Well, if a third of adult children are anxious or depressed, we can assume that a lot of their parents are suffering too. And plus, with more children moving back home, their parents are more likely to come face to face with their adult child's depression, anxiety, or substance abuse. Perhaps as a result of this, many parents are less than overjoyed at the prospect of their adult children moving back home. Decades ago, you'd see articles in the popular press about coping with the loneliness of the empty nest. Well, if you flip through AARP magazine nowadays, you don't see many of these. They had me write an article for parents who want their empty nest back. And not long ago, I did an interview with a reporter about strategies for getting your adult child to move all their junk out of your house. Moving back home after college changes the adult's life too. Here's one change that doesn't get a lot of attention in stories about how the housing crisis is affecting young people. Ordinarily, the 20s and 30s are the years of greatest sexual activity. I don't mean that the sex is necessarily great, just that you're probably having it more than in any other age. Well, sleeping in a bedroom down the hall from your parents during life's peak period of sexual activity probably puts a bit of a damper on your sex life. But many young adults have to endure this because they can't afford to move out. They're back in their childhood bedrooms. So if they want to have sex in their own bed, they've got to tolerate Paddington Bear and Winnie the Pooh looking on. And I guess now George really has something to be curious about. <laughs> Seriously, I do wonder whether the increase in adult children living with their parents and its impact on people's sexual experimentation has contributed to the postponement of marriage. If you have fewer opportunities to test drive the car, you might put it off making a purchase. Because living with your parents after finishing college hasn't been normative in the United States, parents and young people don't know what to make of it or how best to navigate it. They don't know what the rules should be. They may have very different expectations for what their life together will be like, and they don't know how long this living arrangement will last. As a rule, we don't like uncertainty, and this uncertainty about living arrangements is exacerbated by the fact that in this country, 
living with your parents after graduating from college has negative connotations. After all, the Matthew McConaughey movie is called Failure to Launch, not congratulations on moving back in with mom and dad. In many parts of the world, continuing to live with your parents is seen as normal, but that's not the case here. And it will be interesting to see whether society's view of this changes as it becomes more common, as I expect it will. When I was recording the audiobook version of You and Your Adult Child, I worked closely with two people in their late 20s. Hearing me narrate the text was their first exposure to the material. And because they were charged to monitor the quality of the recording, they had to pay close attention to every word. And after the first day, the producer took me aside and said, my parents have got to read this book. They don't understand me. And two days later, I heard the same thing from the sound engineer. Now the prolonged transition into adulthood has not only delayed the timing of important social milestones like marriage or financial independence, it's also shifted some important psychological issues to a later point in development, which has altered their meaning and altered family dynamics. And no issue has been more effective than the adult child's development of autonomy. So I'd like to look at this now. Psychologists point to two periods when clashes over autonomy are common, toddlerhood and early adolescence, the terrible twos, and the terrible teens. These are both times when individuation is a central issue for the child. It's a time when children behave in ways that put some emotional distance between themselves and their parents. It's a normal part of growing up. And although it's usually the case that the process of individuation is set in motion by the child, parents play an active role in either facilitating it or hindering it. Now, I now think that because of the ways in which times have changed, a third individuation process takes place sometime around age 30. But unlike the individuation processes of toddlerhood and adolescence, which we often prepare parents for, when your adult child individuates, it's unexpected. You understandably thought that this aspect of your relationship with your child was going to be settled by the end of adolescence. That was probably true for you. Well, that might have been the case in the past, but as I've stressed, the timetable of young adulthood has changed. And that's one of the three reasons that relationships between parents and their adult children are not what they used to be. A second force making relationships between parents and adult children especially challenging these days concerns the expectations of today's parents. They have been intensely involved in their kids' lives from the moment they were born. They don't need a book because they and their adult child are estranged. It's just the opposite. They need a book because they're so involved. I'm the parent of an adult child, and my wife and I are very close to him, our daughter-in-law, and our grandson. We also have a new granddaughter who was born just two weeks ago, and I assume that we'll be close to her too. As I was writing the book, it struck me that you don't have to be estranged to need some guidance and support during a developmental transition that comes as a surprise. Even in the closest of families, issues arise that are unanticipated, perplexing, and complicated. I know that this was the case for me. As parents, people of my generation were far closer to their children than our parents were to us. They searched for a preschool like it was a matter of life or death. They oohed and awed at kindergarten art shows as if they were sipping Chardonnay at a gallery opening in Chelsea. They came to every back to school night with a notebook in hand so that they remember every detail, which they later review with their child when they got home. They screamed from the sidelines at every soccer game. They tried to be the cool parents who had meaningful conversations with all their kids' high school friends. And they were actively involved in the college application process, <laughs> proofing, sometimes even writing their teenager's essay. And when their child went off to college, 
they stayed in touch multiple times a day in some cases. My undergraduate students at Temple have to turn their cell phones off during exam week because their parents are texting them so often that they can't concentrate on studying. In contrast, my own contact with my parents during college was limited to an obligatory short phone call on Sunday afternoon from the payphone in my dorm. My parents, who were very good parents, played absolutely no rule in my choice of where to go to school. Professors today tell stories about being contacted by their undergrads' parents to inquire or to complain about a grade their child received. My parents hardly knew what classes I was taking, much less the names of my professors. This constant contact between young adults and their parents that we see today is a new phenomenon. Previous generations of parents weren't nearly as close to their kids. Let me give you a personal illustration. When I was in my early 30s, I went through a difficult period with my parents. At the time, we all lived in Southern California. My wife-to-be and I were planning our wedding, and my parents were unhappy with the arrangements we were making, both for the ceremony and for the reception. Now, my wife, who got along very well with my parents, tried to mediate between us, but she wasn't successful. We just could not come to an acceptable agreement. And I was especially bothered by my father's behavior because he and I were very close. And growing up, I felt he understood me well. I was used to fighting with my mother, but never with my father. My parents had their displeasure on display at the wedding. Things were so tense and I was so infuriated by their behavior that my wife and I left the next day for our honeymoon without even saying goodbye. And after we returned, our communication with them was awkward and infrequent. Plus, soon after we returned, I accepted a new position at the University of Wisconsin. My wife and I moved halfway across the country to Madison. So we didn't see each other regularly as we had in the past. Now things eventually returned to normal, but it took some time. And to be honest, the birth of our son, my parents' first grandchild, two years after the wedding. Neither generation wanted things to be strained after he was born. But we had never had an open conversation about what had taken place. But one night during a visit to their house when our son was a few months old, my father and I stayed up for a nightcap. I told him I wanted to talk about our relationship. He looked at me as if I'd said I wanted to talk about space aliens. Relationship? What relationship? I'm your father. Now, it's very hard to imagine a parent saying something like that to their child now. But my father, born in the 1920s, was very much a man of his generation. He graduated from West Point. He had served in the military. He was stoical and unemotional, although he was also kind, caring, and attentive. It just wasn't his style to talk about feelings or relationships. Today's parents of adult children grew up in a completely different cultural climate in which talking about and analyzing relationships is commonplace, even expected. And parents define their roles very differently than my father and his peers did. I can't imagine my parents reading a book on child care, except perhaps Dr. Spock's baby in child care. And even then, only to look up something concrete, like when to start solid food or how to ease the pain of teething. In contrast, today's parents of young adults have a long history of continual hands-on involvement in their children's lives. And they may wonder whether there's any reason to change course just because their child is now an adult. Parents who've been so intensely involved for so long may expect this level of involvement to continue even as their kids enter adulthood. Neither generation is sure just what the proper boundaries should be. It's uncharted territory. And that's why all those AARP members have been looking for advice, not because they were estranged, but because they're involved. But neither they nor their adult children know just how to make the transition into this next phase of their relationship. So young adulthood has changed, and parents have changed. 
The third contributor to what's going on in families with adult children is our moment in historical time. It's a challenging time for all of us, but the times have taken a harder toll on young people than any other age group. As I mentioned earlier, rates of depression and anxiety among teenagers and young adults have risen dramatically in the last two decades. And lest you think this is just because of COVID, they were rising before the pandemic erupted. I'm often asked to explain these mental health trends. And what I say is that it's not just one thing, and it's unlikely to be primarily due to social media. Social media may be adversely affecting some young teenage girls, but I hardly think that not getting sufficient attention on Instagram is causing people in their mid-20s to feel such despair, as many do. In the Harvard study I mentioned earlier, respondents were asked what they thought were the most important contributors to their mental health problems. Financial strain was at the top of the list. Social media barely made the top 20. And guess what? Social media barely made the top 20 on teenagers' lists either. In their minds, their number one contributor to negative mental health is, act is achievement pressure. There's no shortage of things for young people to feel distressed about. An uncertain economy, climate change, political divisiveness, mass shootings, income inequality, racism and discrimination, student loan debt, threats to women's reproductive autonomy, and the very real possibility that viral epidemics are gonna be a part of life as we now know it. Not to mention the weekly reminders that they will never live a life as comfortable as their parents. Is it any wonder that so many young people are anxious or depressed? And because today's parents of adult children are so close to their kids, so involved in their lives, in such frequent contact, they come face to face with their kids' mental health issues. And for many parents with adult children, the challenges of navigating this phase of their relationship may be complicated by their kids' substance abuse, depression, or chronic anxiety. The financial context in which today's young people make the transition to adulthood in which the cost of housing has risen five times faster than salaries, has had an especially profound impact on family relationships. And this is one of the most common topics I'm asked for advice about. I doubt that there are many parents who anticipated having to help support their children financially when their kids were in their 30s. But I also doubt that many young people expected that they'd be needing their parents' help at this age. And these violations of expectations can affect the parent-child relationship and both generations' mental health. Earlier, I mentioned how autonomy arises as an issue during this phase of your relationship with your adult child. The unexpected nature of the prolonged financial dependence of adult children on their parents has made the adult's child autonomy a fraught issue in many families. Adult children and their parents are in a bind caused by the conflict between financial dependence and emotional independence. In some households, because they may feel conflicted about receiving their parents' financial assistance, adult children assert their autonomy in other realms, often rejecting or resisting their parents' advice. It's a way of saying, I still need you to support me financially, but this doesn't mean I'm not capable of managing my own life without your input. The toddler's quest for individuation is about needing to show their parents and themselves that they're a separate person who has their own opinions about what to wear, what to eat, what to play with, when to go to bed. The teenager's question is about their need to assert their point of view, to show their parents that they no longer view themselves, I mean, sorry, no longer view their parents as all-knowing, who's always correct, and which is why they take such pleasure in pointing out their parents' flaws, inconsistencies, and occasional hypocrisy. The adult child's desire for autonomy has a different purpose. It's to prove to their parents and to themselves that they're capable of managing the challenges of adulthood on their own. But when they're forced to depend on their parents for money, this is harder to do. It's a lot easier to roll your eyes at parents whose suggestions you would rather not hear 
when you aren't at the same time asking them to pay for your cell phone, much less a down payment on a house. The unexpected financial dependence of adult children on their parents isn't easy on parents either. They may wonder whether their financial assistance entitles them to express opinions about how their child is spending the money that they're providing. They may worry about the impact on their own financial well-being and their plans for retirement. They may not know whether they should speak up or bite their tongue when they see something that concerns them. And they may have mental health needs of their own that arise because of difficulties in the relationship. I have friends who sought therapy because of problems in their relationship with an adult child. So in you and your adult child, after discussing why the relationship between parents and adult children has changed and why it's so challenging in today's world, I turn to specific topics that families confront during this stage of life in the realms of mental health, education, finances, romance, and grandparenthood. And I discuss how to tell if your kid is floundering in any of these domains. And I'm sure that we'll discuss many of these specific issues in the Q&A period after I finish my remarks. But let me just say a few things now about each of these domains and mention some of the common issues that parents bring to my attention. With regard to mental health, I point out that there's no other period of life when people are more vulnerable to mental health problems than the teens and early 20s. If you look at statistics concerning the average age of onset of the serious mental health problems, you see that most problems appear for the first time during this stage of life. This is due to a combination of things. Most mental health problems are the product of the interplay between individual vulnerability and life stress. This vulnerability can be genetic or temperamental, but we now know that at least some of it is developmental in that the brain is more susceptible to the influence of the environment at some ages than others. And the teens and early 20s comprise a time when the brain is especially malleable, or as neuroscientists call it, plastic. That means that the same environmental influence will have a more profound effect on the brain at this age than before or after. There's nothing that can be done about this vulnerability because it's related to the impact of puberty on the brain, which makes the brain more responsive to stress. But adolescents and young adulthood are also times when there's a lot of stress on people, and perhaps more so today than in past generations. So while we can't make the brain less vulnerable, we can take steps to minimize stress in young people's lives, to help them learn how to cope with it, and to provide extra emotional support when they need it. Because your adult child is no longer a minor, you don't have the right to be involved in their therapy, but there's nothing stopping you from expressing concern and offering support when you think something is off. In the realm of education, I tell parents that no matter how involved they were in their child's elementary or secondary school, it's not a good idea to be involved in their college education beyond providing financial assistance when you can. Let your child pick their own major and their own courses. Rather than intervene when something needs attending to, it's better to encourage them to look for help on campus because it's almost certainly there. College is not just about academics. It's about learning to take responsibility for your own life. And if your parents are stepping in and solving life's problems for you, you're not going to learn how to do it on your own. That large tuition bill you're paying is not just for classes. A lot of it goes toward the multitude of services that colleges and universities provide. And you should encourage your child to seek out and to use them. In the realm of finances, I get two questions more often than any others. The first concerns how much financial assistance, if any, parents should provide. And to this I say, the important issue isn't how much you provide, but what you and your child understand the arrangement to be. Before you start providing help, make sure to have a conversation about how much you will be providing, what it's to be used for, and how long the arrangement will continue. Giving financial help doesn't give you the right to monitor their spending or veto their expenditures. But you and your child have to agree that when your child no longer needs your help, 
who no longer needs as much of it, they will let you know. If you're providing assistance and think your child is living extravagantly, it's fine to say something like, it seems like you don't need as much help from us as you did before. So let's discuss the arrangement. The other question I get asked a lot concerns establishing rules for living together if your child has moved back home. I can't tell you what these rules should be because every household is different. But what I can say is that before your child moves back home, it's important to have a candid conversation about everyone's expectations to make sure that you're all on the same page. In the realm of romance, the most frequent question I'm asked is some version of, why isn't my kid married yet? And the answer is usually something like, because people don't get married as young these days as they did when you were a young adult. As a rule of thumb, in all aspects of your child's life, it's best to avoid judging them on the basis of the timetable you followed when you were growing up. I'll have more to say about this in a moment. And in my book, I also spend some time discussing your relationship with your child's partner. The thrust of my argument is that it's crucial that you do what you can to make this relationship a good one. Because if it isn't, it's going to create tension in your relationship with your adult child that may become insurmountable. You don't have to love your child's partner, but you will need to find a way to get along. And finally, I, I wanna say a few words about grandparenthood. One of the most challenging aspects of being a grandparent is knowing what to do when you're not crazy about the way your grandchild is being raised. Should you share your thoughts and advice or bite your tongue? I think it's far better to hold your nose and look the other way than to be a backseat parent. I say this for several reasons. First, parenting advice tends to change generationally. Your child is very likely parenting the way their pediatrician recommended or how the advice books they use suggested or in a way that's similar to that of their friends. They didn't get the advice that you got from your pediatrician 30 years ago, or that you got from Dr. Spock, Penelope Leach, or Barry Brazelton. That doesn't mean that the advice you received was bad advice or is no longer relevant. It's that advice changes. Today's parents tend to use a style of parenting actually that was popular in the 1930s when it was called scientific parenting. A generation ago, when we were parents, we were far more relaxed and far less rigid. Today's best-selling parenting gurus think they invented something new, but they've just repackaged the advice from several generations ago. A second reason to avoid giving advice about your child's parenting behavior is that how their parenting doesn't really matter that much. There are many good ways to raise a child and your grandchild will turn out fine. Especially during infancy and toddlerhood, so much of development is genetically programmed. Little tweaks here and there don't make much of a difference. Your kid will learn this if they have a second child. All new parents think they're more influential than they are. As soon as they have a second child, whom they parent in exactly the same way as their first child, but it turns out very different, they realize the limits of their influence. And finally, the reason you shouldn't give a lot of parenting advice is that the most important thing you can do as a grandparent is to make your child feel more confident and competent as a parent. That's what's best for your grandchild. So go easy on the criticism and instead take time to compliment them on what a great job they're doing. So before the q and I'd just like to conclude with some basic advice for parents with adult children. First, accept the fact that parenting never ends. You're going to be an actively engaged parent for longer than you expected. Second, resist using the timetable you followed as a young adult to gauge your child's progress toward and through the transition to adulthood. Stop saying or even thinking when I was your age. Yes, you were once their age, but times are very different now. And don't mistakenly conclude that your kid is floundering because they aren't following the same timetable that you did. Third, respect your adult child's need for autonomy. Once you appreciate what the underlying issues are, 
you'll better understand why your child rose their eyes at your advice, ask you to mind your own business, or actively resist your well-intended suggestions. If you understand that individuation is the root cause of this, you'll see why you shouldn't take it personally. I tell parents to remember that when this happens, to remind themselves, it's not about you. Fourth, when trying to decide whether to speak your mind or bite your tongue, I think you should follow this general rule. Speak up if your adult child is about to do something that will have serious, irreparable, harmful consequences. But unless your child specifically asks for your opinion, keep it to yourself. This will help facilitate your adult child's development of autonomy. Your goal should be to help your child feel capable and confident, able to handle the challenges of adulthood on their own. And finally, keep in mind that this is another transitional time in the parent-child relationship. Transitional times are always challenging for parents and their children. Relationships are being redefined and realigned, and there'll be some rough patches. You found this out during previous development, developmental transitions. And if you understand that a lot of what's going on is about the adult child's need for autonomy, the tensions that you and they may feel will dissipate and you may develop an even closer and maybe better relationship with your adult child. Maybe you'll even develop a relationship. Thank you very much for your attention. And now I'll turn it back to our hosts who will moderate the Q&A. Thank you, Dr. Steinberg. Um, that was very interesting and helpful. Um, I wanted to let people know that if you have a question for Dr. Steinberg, please um, type it into the chat uh, box and uh, I will ask him uh, the question. Um, I have a question about um, the uh, issue of this uh, sense of uh, depression and other mental health um, anxiety issues. Is there a difference between um, the genders? Do you find that more adult men are having problems more than women? Um, and uh, I just anecdotally hear that. And it seems, you know, we hear that there are more, more uh, girls staying in school longer, becoming professionals more often, grad school. Um, what do you, do you have any information on that? Yes. Um, and the answer is that it's hard to know for sure. And that's because um, young men and young women express mental health problems in very different ways. Um, women tend to do what psychologists call internalize. So right. when they're having mental health problems, they express it as depression or anxiety. Um, men, on the other hand, tend to express their mental health problems by externalizing, by acting out, by becoming aggressive or engaging in illegal behavior or abusing substances. And the problem in answering your question is that in the national surveys that measure mental health among young people, we ask a lot of questions about depression and anxiety, and we don't ask very many questions about the behaviors that typically characterize young men's mental health issues. It is certainly the case, as you noted in your question, that from an academic standpoint, an achievement standpoint, young women are doing much better than young men. Right. Um, my guess is that both young men and young women are suffering because of the times we live in. There's no reason to think that the financial strain um, is affecting one gender more than the other. Um, and the other things on the list, like climate change um, or political divisiveness um, or mass shootings. I, I, you know, it, it doesn't make sense to me to say that women would be more affected. I think we just, <laughs> I, 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 oh, I'll say it this way. Okay. The way that women express mental health problems makes us sympathize with them. The way that men express mental health problems makes us angry at them. And so I think that women's mental health problems, young women's mental health problems, get a lot more attention in the popular press than men's do. Okay, thank you. Um, You're welcome. We have, um, let's see, we have some questions. Um, 
Our 23-year-old daughter is still restricted in her activities because of COVID. She wears a mask. Um, wait a minute, I'm losing this. Um, with us in our house and seems to have a great deal of difficulty in finding a job because of her feelings about wearing masks. Do you have any advice about that? Yeah. Um, I, I wonder whether whether her behavior is really about COVID or whether she's suffering from some kind of mental health problem that's going undiagnosed and untreated. Um, it, it, you know, assuming that that her parents are testing themselves, um, which would be kind to do given her concern, um, she can know whether there's a risk to her um, contracting COVID around the house. And if her parents are clear, um, she probably doesn't need to wear a mask when she's with them. And I, I, I'm not accusing her of using COVID as an excuse for not getting a job, but I would think that some counseling might be um, called for at this, at this point in time. And uh, someone else has, says, my 32 year old child is still living at home and none of us are unhappy. Do I need to feel guilty that he's not more independent? No. Um, well, you don't need to feel guilty about any about anything that your son is doing at the age of 32. Um, but I will say that there are many ways to measure independence other than whether you're still living with your parents or not. And so if if your son is living at home and congratulations that you're all happy, I think that's great. Um, if your son is living at home and everybody's getting along and he has a job or he's in school and he's um, completing the responsibilities that he has, um, I don't think you should feel bad um, about it. Um, you know, if you were living in Italy, your 32 year old son would be living with you and nobody would bat an eyelash about it. And it's just that it's been so uncommon in the United States that it raises concerns where maybe they don't need to be raised. Okay. And uh, someone else is asking about children that come home with a drug or substance abuse behavior. Where to start? How to deal with it? <laughs> well, um, you certainly need to help them get into treatment for the substance abuse. Um, as I said during my talk, because they're not a minor anymore, you can't make them get treatment. You can't accompany them to get treatment. But um, you really, uh, you, you really need, what you can do is you can make their getting treatment a, a precondition for them living at home. And you can, um, you can ban the use of the problematic substances um, in your house. Um, but, I, I, you know, substance abuse is a treatable problem. And I think you can do, take the necessary steps to help your child find a healthcare provider who can help. Very stressful for everybody though. Um, yes. So someone says here, you seem to only address families where college is part of the path. Many families don't go on to college. Is this a class definition? <laughs> well, um, the majority of young people in the United States enroll in college. It's about 75% now okay. uh, enroll out of high school. Um, but yes, I mean, clearly um, there, there's a class difference in who goes to college and who doesn't go to college. Um, in the book, I, I actually devote part of a chapter on alternatives to college where okay. I discuss different pathways to success in adulthood that might be relevant for families um, who, whose child doesn't want to go to college. Okay. Um, here's a note from someone who has an adult daughter who's 41 living with me. She does not contribute financially to the household. She will help if asked. She is a hoarder and has two um, bedrooms full of expensive clothes. She has no intention of moving out. I've encouraged her to move out. At times I feel she's taking over. She uses the living room as her office. What advice would you have for this person? Well, I think you need to take a more active role in 
um, in, in, in defining what your daughter's responsibilities are um, and um, in uh, discussing your expectations for how she is to behave. Um, I, I think that it's important for adult children living at home to be you know, active members of a household. And that includes doing household chores and helping out with home management um, issues. And if um, she's not willing to do that, uh, maybe she shouldn't be living um, in your house with you. Um, if someone here has um, three, uh, who had three grandchildren um, at, let's see, my mother had three grandchildren when she was 60. This woman is finding it very difficult. She's very disappointed because none of her children have had children yet. She has no grandchildren and she's afraid she'll be very elderly by the time she has any grandchildren, if she does. It's hard to cope with this hole in my expected life's trajectory. I think they will also have regrets. What would you say to this person? Well, I understand um, and, and, and I sympathize, um, but people are having children at a later age today than in the past. Um, that's probably because they're getting married later, but it's also because there are new technologies that have made um, a successful pregnancy um, more likely among um, people who are older, who are in their late 30s or even in their early 40s. Um, I don't think, I, I think this is a great question and a great issue to think about. I don't have a solution. You know, obviously you can't guilt your child into having a child just because you want to be a grandparent. Perhaps you can find another outlet for your nurturing instincts, like as an aunt um, or as a proxy grandparent for, you know, a friend's, uh, a friend's grandchildren or some other people that you know. But I, I'm, I'm very sympathetic and I, you know, I don't think that this issue has gotten a lot of attention. Mm -hmm. And um, this next question is about finances. Um, how do you feel about children raised in financially well family? I think it must mean financially comfortable and have no concept of financial responsibility. How do you get kids to feel this financial privilege is not going to continue? Um, yeah, that's a great question and one that I'm actually asked um, fairly frequently. Um, in, in the book, I discuss something that's called the 40-70 rule, which mm -hmm. is that you need to have a candid conversation about finances with your child before your child turns 40 and before you turn 70. Okay. Um, and part of that conversation in, you know, involves um, uh, ma managing money, um, the importance of um, of work to one's well-being and self-esteem, um, the independent of, of income that it generates, um, and also to talk about what your plans for the future are. I, I, th I think that um, sometimes parents are reluctant to talk about what their, what their estate planning is, mm -hmm. um, but most estate planners recommend that parents have this kind of candid conversation with their children so that everybody knows what the future will bring. It's also the case that there are adult children who are worried about their parents' financial well-being and financial health. And another reason to have this financial conversation is to let your child know how you're doing financially and whether they're going to be expected to, um, to help support you um, in, in your later years. Right, right, good point. Um... Uh, this uh, woman writes, my 33-year-old daughter has been laid off three jobs in two years. She procrastinates and is very picky about prospective employers. She's living with me and we are not happy. I'm constantly criticized that I don't get her. Do you have any suggestions? Um, well, uh, you know, I would need to know more about why she's been laid off. Was she laid off because of her behavior as an employee, or was she laid off because of, um, you know, retrenchment in the industry that she's working in? If it's the former, um, maybe th there are ways to focus on changing her behavior so that she's more successful um, in th the workplace. 
I, I also would have a conversation about how you expect her to be spending her time while she's um, unemployed. And she should be spending that time doing various things to increase the likelihood of her finding um, a, you know, a, a, an appropriate job. And that means every day um, doing something that's gonna contribute to that goal. Okay. Um, let's see. Oh, can you comment on gender identity in relation to uh, this evening's topic? Yeah, um, I do have a, you know, I'm sure you can all appreciate that in a 45 minute talk, <laughs> I have you to pick and choose what that. topics discuss. And there's a there's a, a, a long, long discussion of this in, in the book. Um, I think that um, a, a, a lot of, a lot more young people are questioning their gender identity. Um, and it is um, possible that your adult child um, will come to you with a revelation about their gender identity or their sexual orientation. And I, I can only say that it's important that you love and support them um, no matter what your feelings are about their sexuality. Um, and, um, you know, a, a, as I write, it, it's the same person, right? I mean, you just know something different about them um, that you didn't know before, but it's still your child. It's the same person that he or she was before they told you this. Also, a final thought about it. Um, people generally come to terms with their own gender identity and sexual orientation during adolescence. Um, so if they're, if they're disclosing something to you for the first time as an adult child, they, it has taken them a long time to build up the courage to do this. And I think you should be grateful that they um, are are able to talk to you about such um, a, a, an often fraught topic. Great. Um, there's a question about uh, adult children who can't seem to form relationships with the other sex and how that means uh, that these people will not have grandchildren. I know in uh, in my own family, there um, I have a sister-in-law who's got a married daughter who has decided not to have children. My own sister has a son who's 37 is not involved with anybody and is still living at home. Um, is that common? Is there more? Are there more and more young people deciding just not to have children at all? Absolutely. Um, there are more and more people deciding not to have children. Um, there are um, more and more people who are delaying it. Um, and so it may appear to you that they've decided not to have children, right. but they may have children down the road. Um, as, as we've discussed already, people are delaying getting married. Um, a, lot of, uh, a, a lot of individuals may be um, in a relationship but not living together uh, like a married couple. Um, I, I, I just think that th there just isn't a way that your need to, to be a grandparent um, can make your child become a parent if your child is not interested in being a parent. Um, <clears throat> but also remember that, you know, a lot of people don't get married until they're in their late 30s or early 40s. And the statistics are quite clear. Um, the chances that, that an unmarried 37-year-old man is going to be married by the time he's in his mid-40s are very high. Um, okay. And so remember that the timetable has changed. And yes. um, yeah, so. Right. Um, and... Uh... One more question that is maybe about a little bit younger um, kids. How do you handle the situation when one child is a superstar and the other child struggles to do well in school and in college? Um, well, uh, you know, I, I think that children, children from the same family are often quite different, you know, in their personalities and in their talents and in their skills. Um, and not everybody has to be an academic superstar. There are other ways to find meaning and success in life. And um, I think you should ask whether there are interests and talents that the non-superstar child has that you might help um, cultivate and in encourage him or her to develop further. Okay. Um 
Here's a, a another financial question. Seems that there's a lot of financial issues out there. Uh, my 45 year old son and his wife are always in debt. He's responsible for seven children. He's had two marriages and depends on his mother, me, for money constantly to pay for household, car, food, and utilities. Uh, her parents give a little money once in a while, but I worry about my grandchildren not having what they need and I find it difficult not to help. And uh, they don't have bank a bank account or credit and it costs her money to even send money. What to do? Well, um, there are a lot of issues in that question. Um, right. the, the, the first is that um, if you can provide financial assistance that's dedicated to helping your grandchildren, that's one way to, to deal with this issue um, in, a, in a manner that might make you feel better about doing it. In other words, um, if you're, you know, if, if you're, your son and his partner can't afford quality schooling or childcare, you can help out there, but you can write the check for that to the school so that you know that the money is going to benefit the, the grandchildren. Um, right. If you feel that they're mismanaging your finances and certainly not having a bank account, I think qualifies as that these days, um, perhaps you can help them figure out, you know, how to do a better job of, of that. Um, you know, as I said before, um, if you can assist your kids financially, that's great. But you shouldn't do anything that threatens your own well-being or retirement um, or, um, uh, or, or, or life. So um, you just need to decide how much you can give. And there may be a point in which you can say, I I'm tapped out. I, I, there, I just don't have more resources um, to, to provide. Right. Well, um, I think... Uh, we are, we've answered most of the questions. I'm sure there are a few more waiting, um, but I believe that we're running out of out of our time. And uh, I don't want to um, overstay our welcome with you. You've been very generous with your time, Dr. Steinberg. And um, I really appreciate uh, the book. It's, it's uh, really well done and uh, much needed because as we can tell just from tonight, there are lots of questions out there and things have changed. So. Thank you. Um, and, and I invite anybody in the audience that didn't have their question answered um, to email me. Um, my, my, my email is very easy to find on the Temple University website, um, but it is my initials, LD, D for David, S at temple.edu. And I will do my best to, to reply to your email. Well, oh, that's very generous of you. Thank you very much for everything tonight. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you for inviting me. Um, good night, everybody, and thank you for uh, for your attention. Judith? Thank you so much for uh, being here, and um, and yeah, and your, it was a fantastic lecture. Thank you. A lot of accolades in the uh, chat now. Thank you, and um, thanks to all of you on the team for setting this up and doing such a job that made it run so smoothly, so I'm very appreciative. Our pleasure. Thank you. Okay. All right. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night.